when, when Sean and Silvers were organising this, um, we thought we might try and wrap up with a few sort of common themes, and that's really what I'm going to uh, try and um, do briefly. Um, so um, first, really, just to remind people of, of maybe of the challenge and uh, highlight a great paradox. So this is... Um, um, an article that's well worth reading, um, for, which is 22 years old now, I suppose, but it was in New England Journal of Medicine, and it looked back over the sort of thousand years leading up to the year 2000 and highlighted um, several um, advances in, in medical sciences that, that it, it thought really were quite transformative and, and quite substantial. So, for example, discovery of antibiotics. And um, Imaging um, gets into um, the, I think it was 11 or so characteristics that were pulled out as being really quite critical. So in particular, it was focusing on cross-sectional imaging, but I, I, we can include all the PET um, methods as well here. Um, and it's really transformed the way in which we manage patients. It, it's, it's completely different from, from how we manage patients um, a few decades ago in cancer and in really all types of medicine. So imaging is without doubt seen as a fantastic development um, in modern medicine. But then we have this paradox that um, it's uh, when we look at um, using imaging or other methods to derive um, biomarkers, um, it's really very difficult um, often to translate these through to the clinic. Now, it's totally appropriate that many biomarkers don't make it very far um, because th they can be devalidated. And when we talk about go, no-go decisions, it may be appropriate to stop them. But um, we really should be doing better at getting biomarkers through to the clinic. And uh, this editorial um, from George Post in, in uh, Nature um, 11 years ago is now, uh, I'm sure, very out of date in terms of the precise numbers. But I think the point's made that it's a very, very small um, fraction of biomarkers that actually get through to clinical practice. And so really a key theme of a lot of the work of NCETA and um, in particular this conference, um, this virtual conference um, th this year is looking at how we might improve that and have practice change. Um, so we saw with um, several of the talks, but I think Jason's talk epitomised this as, as well as anything, that there is a need for novel imaging signals. So he pointed out um, very nicely how um, certain um, zirconian labelled antibody uh, PET methods can outperform uh, maybe uh, more established methods such as FTG PET, and they can really tell us something quite different because that imaging test is actually uh, honing in on the precise biology that we're we're interested in in a way that, for example, FTG PET might not be in this particular case. And it doesn't mean that FTG PET is not a very useful uh, imaging method in many circumstances. It is, but there are some examples where it doesn't perform, and we maybe need an alternative um, technique. Uh, and Jason. Um, it gave us lots of very good examples on that. Um, and more generally, we can um, look at um, the fact that uh, as our understanding of cancer biology expands the whole time and consequently we can develop uh, therapies targeted um, to various aspects of that cancer biology. Um, so, so here summarizing the calcium form in the hallmarks of uh, cancer uh, by Hannah Hannah Weinberg. Um, there are so many different targets and of course we can use imaging to try and tap into these targets. So there are various different um, PET methods that are already um, used in the clinic and there are MR methods that might try and challenge that We're around hyperpolarized uh, carbon methods, uh, different, well, well, part of which um, Jonathan just uh, talked about, although he focused on fumarate, but uh, there are examples such as pyruvate that are, that are undergoing uh, clinical exploration. Um, and the methods such as those described by Jason. Um, and in um, the DCMRI world and MR, there are various different methods that are, are being um, looked at. Um, so there's a whole host of new imaging signals, uh, and that's a good thing, but the challenge is to work out which of these signals are actually telling us something useful and um, then taking those techniques forward. And it's not just the imaging signals that's important, it's also the image analysis. So um, Fergus in particular uh, yesterday talked um, about uh, aspects of image analysis with AI. Um, and there are lots of great opportunities there to uh, use um, artificial intelligence, uh, but there are also very many other image analysis techniques that people are developing, which potentially um, are also transformative. So it's not just a question of looking at the most appropriate uh, signal, it's also how we take that data and use it, uh, how we analyze and, and pull out the, the best biomarker here, the most relevant biomarker, and to what extent um, do we need AI or, or other 
um, methods to help do that. So these are two very big themes really in, um, in imaging in general and in cancer imaging in particular at the moment. Um, and then Catherine's talk today also reminds us that there are certain areas that we maybe have quite a strong track record in, in cancer imaging. So for example, around um, evaluating um, response, uh, but there are other um, areas that we maybe don't have quite so good a track record in, um, in um, certainly many of the groups working in the UK around early detection, and that's an area that CRUK is pushing uh, very strongly. So there, of course, there were very good imaging precedents for early detection, but um, maybe a lot of our our research efforts ha has not made maybe focus on that in the last um, few years. So that's an important area that we um, in the UK cancer imaging uh, community need to uh, potentially uh, focus on. Uh, and Catherine made the point there that it's not simply uh, early disease detection that we might think of in early detection. We can also look at response assessment, prediction, and recurrence, and how we can detect um, that early. So those are probably some key themes that have come out of um, the talks of the last few days. And really for all of these, we need to think about how we can um, take our imaging, um, our imaging methods and, and when they produce biomarkers, the imaging biomarkers, and take them across these translational gaps, which are barriers um, to clinical effectiveness. So when we cross gap one, it's all about taking imaging biomarker from a lab um, to be in a state where it can be used to test a hypothesis in um, cancer research. And crossing gap two is when we can take the biomarker and use it to make a decision managing a patient with cancer. Um, so crossing these gaps is not straightforward, uh, but by doing so, we use the imaging readouts to guide decision making and they become practice changing. So um, one um, thought I want to uh, um, maybe um, leave you with is the importance when we're got, when we have these general principles about the imaging biomarker roadmap and uh, taking biomarkers from uh, lab uh, tools through to crossing those gaps. We need to be careful about what we select as a candidate. And in this sense, we can think of um, biomarker development a little bit akin to drug development, perhaps. And um, we need to be um, working out how do we take a candidate and get to a biomarker that's locked down. So a number of the talks that we heard have um, focused on some of the um, possible signals that we might want to use or the image analysis techniques. But in all these cases, we need to actually work out what is our locked down biomarker. So, for example, if we look at something like um, DCMRI or one of the many um, PET methods that uh, Jason talked about today, uh, we need to know when we take that imaging signal, when we analyze that data, what is the biomarker? So is it, for example, the change in median K trans? Um, what exactly is that biomarker? And to get to that position, there's a lot of biological validation, clinical validation and technical validation that needs to be undertaken. Um, and we have to get rid of many of those biomarkers along the way that don't perform, that don't have um, good relationship to biology, that perform poorly when we look at precision uh, or accuracy, for example. And um, that's um, something which Catherine uh, Hines mentioned in her talk, really. We need to um, be better at looking at when biomarkers aren't um, performing. And I think particularly in the drug development world, people are better at that. We're not so good at that in the academic research world. We tend to let a lot of these biomarkers um, hang around that, that maybe need to be um, devalidated, certainly for specific indications. Um, and to achieve this, of course, we need multidisciplinary uh, expertise, multidisciplinary science. And then when we've got a biomarker that's locked down and something that can be tested in larger clinical studies, we need, I think, to find a killer app for this biomarker. So the successes in imaging are when we find an application or maybe more than one, but at least one, where we can say this imaging is critical to address a certain clinical problem. And if you don't have the imaging, you find that your management of the patient is severely impaired. And I think that is something, again, we need to be slightly better at, uh, having that real sense of what the end game is and being able to convince those people who are maybe not that imaging friendly that in a particular case, our biomarker is so important that they'd be mad not to use it. And again, to get to that um, stage, we need to ask questions around clinical utility uh, qualification and then continued analysis of, of precision and accuracy, often though, in this case, in multi-center studies. And again, we have to get rid of of the biomarkers that don't get past the stage of lockdown um, and again we need multidisciplinary teamwork and one thing 
uh, which we've touched on, um, but very much in the in the first world sense um, on some of the talks here is about being able to apply these um, biomarkers to different uh, centres, um, maybe across the states or in the UK. But of course, we also need to think of this in a very much a global impact. And um, if the biomarkers are really just stuck in uh, leading centres where we have fantastic technology and expertise, they will be limited. It's very difficult to see how they will make a major uh, impact if we can't at least acquire the data in multiple um, locations throughout the world. Perhaps central analysis in some cases will, will be adequate. Um, so I think for all these biomarkers, if we can get to this stage, then we also need to think about how we can integrate them into healthcare. So we need to look at how we can acquire novel data where necessary, how we can mine um, data on um, NHS or other healthcare uh, systems. Um, it's more of a data analysis question. Um, and various steps need to be performed to achieve this. So if we're acquiring novel data, we need to look at uh, consent, having lockdown SOPs, um, quality assurance, quality control, a lot of uh, steps here where NCT has been involved in trying to improve the situation in the UK, particularly in MRI. Um, and we also need to look at how we can curate um, data uh, that's stored on um, existing NHS systems and on research systems, again, an area where NCTA has an interest with looking at data repositories. Um, and we need to look at how we can then uh, integrate those uh, data and analysis pathways, um, how we can apply appropriate AI algorithms if required, how we can analyze data uh, most appropriately statistically, and again, looking at quality assurance of the, the data as we go along. Um, and then it's really a question of how we use these anatomical data, functional data, and data from non-imaging um, readouts. Um, again, um, I mentioned in some of the talks during this um, mini conference, um, and how we can then combine all those data and link them to other aspects such as um, e-health. Um, so I think these challenges, we've made great progress over the last few years, but there are still a lot to do. And for, for all of these uh, different uh, interesting uh, signals and analysis processes, I think it's important to think how is this going to get into a framework where, as Sean has just said, you know, we can go through different go, no go uh, steps, but ultimately try to get towards clinical translation and uh, cross those translational gaps.